let's turn together tonight in God's Word to Mark's Gospel, the 14th chapter, and we'll be looking at verses 32 through 42 tonight. Mark 14, verses 32 to 42, where God's Word reads as follows. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even unto death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So far, the reading from God's Word together this evening. May He add its blessing to our hearts. As we are in uh, Jesus' last week of public ministry... There is a continuation of the buildup of Jesus' isolation as He goes to the cross. He's come to Jerusalem. He's entered Jerusalem as a king. He, in the triumphal entry, He's cleansed the temple as a priest. He has taught the will of God as a prophet. And yet more and more, His isolation is becoming apparent. And that's really no surprise. That was part of Jesus' ministry. In John 1, in kind of the prologue to that gospel, there is this description of what happened in Jesus' ministry. It says there that Jesus came to His own and His own people did not receive Him. But it is tempting for us to view what's happening to Jesus as a circumstance that is beyond the control of Christ Himself. It's like Jesus is a victim to what is happening to him here in Mark's gospel. It's like Jesus didn't know what was coming or Jesus uh, couldn't control what was happening. Well, who is Jesus? We've learned from this gospel that for sure Jesus is truly a man, but he is not merely a man. We have seen on multiple instances how Jesus is the Son of God, how Jesus is able to command creation, how Jesus is able to command demons, how He makes people to fall before Him in fear when they recognize who He is. And really, He's going to be the victim of being made isolated by the religious leaders? No, Jesus, He comes to Jerusalem for a specific purpose. And it's not right away to establish His glory and His power and His dominion. Jesus comes to Jerusalem for another reason. Yes, it's true. Sometime, every knee will bow before Christ and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. But in this instance, as He journeys to Jerusalem, He goes to humble Himself to humble himself on the cross to accomplish the redemption according to the will of the Father. And as we think about what that means here as he's in Gethsemane praying on his face in the garden, we see Jesus to be alone in his agony when he goes to the cross. Now, that may seem like an obvious statement. What do we mean by that? What we mean is that even prior to Christ hanging on the tree, He is already suffering. Christ has already entered, so to speak, into His passion. He is 
uh, he is going to suffer physical agonies like you and I cannot imagine. But here in this garden, he already suffers emotional agony like you and I cannot imagine. That's because our Savior comes alone in his agony. He suffers that agony as part of his work of redemption. So Jesus is all alone in his agony when he goes to the cross. And to learn that lesson, we're going to look at our text in three parts. First, we're going to see the sorrow of Jesus in verses 32 through 36. Then we're going to see the fatigue of the disciples in verse 37 through 41. And then we're going to consider together the betrayal of Jesus in verse 41 and 42. So the sorrow of Jesus, the fatigue of the disciples, and the betrayal of Jesus. We'll start by looking at the sorrow of Jesus. Jesus goes to the Gethsemane. We don't know much about Gethsemane. We could go off into a rabbit trail to try to describe exactly what Gethsemane is and, and where it is, and, and that would be fine. It might be an interesting thing for you to do in the privacy of your own home, but the purpose of this text for our consideration tonight is not so much what we can know about Gethsemane, but rather why Jesus went there. Jesus goes there specifically to pray, it says in our text. In verse 32, he comes with the 11 disciples, sit here while I pray. Now in Mark's gospel, let's take Mark's gospel alone. In Mark's gospel, prayer is mentioned only 11 times. Three of those times, prayer is simply part of Jesus' conversation. Uh, one ex example of that would be when, when Jesus comes down uh, from the mountain after the transfiguration. There's that demon that, that's, uh, that the disciples can't be cast out. And Jesus says to his disciples, this kind of demon can only be driven out by prayer. He's not teaching anything about it. He's not making an observation about it. He's simply describing, he's using the word prayer in his conversation. So that happens three times, three of the 11 times. Two of the 11 times, Jesus is teaching his disciples specifically about prayer. Uh, and, and so that's the Lord's Prayer uh, in Mark eleven twenty five. 25, whenever you stand praying. One time, so one of the 11 times, Jesus actually commands his disciples to pray. We find that in our text here in, in verse 38. Jesus says, watch and pray. But five of the 11 times, prayer is Jesus' own activity. So it's not teaching us about prayer, it's describing for us that our Savior prayed. And so that's actually the first time that prayer is mentioned in Mark's gospel. Way back in chapter 1, verse 35, Jesus rises very early in the morning. While it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate pray place, and there he prayed. So the first time prayer is mentioned in Mark's gospel, it is Jesus going out in the early morning to pray. And the last time prayer is mentioned in Mark's gospel, it is also Jesus' activity. Here in verse 39, Jesus is described as going away from the three disciples that he took with him and praying in the garden of Gethsemane. And in this text, as we think about Jesus as engaged in prayer and as we learn from Christ and his engagement in prayer, what we see is that Jesus has a reflex reaction to his circumstance. He is facing uh, an agony that we can't imagine. Uh, he's facing the cross. And he knows that he's facing the cross. But beyond the physical torments that the cross might offer to him or might present to him, Jesus goes to the cross with even a greater understanding of what will happen. On the cross, Jesus won't just face a physical agony. On the cross, Jesus will have the wrath of God poured out on him, not for his own sins, but for the sins of people who will abandon him. And all of this is adding up in Jesus' mind. He, he is facing the circumstance of the cross, and he turns to God in prayer in that moment. Now, previously we've seen that Jesus isn't merely a man, that he is powerful and mighty and so on. But then there are also places in Mark's gospel, like the text that we have before us today, 
where we recognize very plainly that Jesus is very much truly a man. He is like us in every way except for sin. That means he has uh, the human emotions. Uh, he has the limitations of a man. He has the social, uh, the social orientation of a man to desire to be with his companions. And here we see Jesus uh, not being void of emotion. He experiences the whole range of human emotion in, in the Gospels, from, from joy to, uh, to here becoming greatly troubled. Uh, Jesus was not a robot. He wasn't a machine. He, wa he was like us in every way. And here in our text, in verse 33, it says that he became greatly distressed and troubled as he looked forward to what was coming. We know that he was greatly distressed and troubled about what was yet coming because of the subject of his prayer. Jesus asked for the hour to pass him by, for, for the cup to pass him by. And, and we'll talk about what that means. But first, let's think about what it means that Jesus was greatly distressed and troubled. Jesus so distressed, he desires his disciples to be with him while he prays. He leaves, <coughs> he leaves eight of the disciples in one place. He he chooses the elite group of three to accompany him and to keep watch with him as he prays. And it says again, verse 33, Jesus began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Now, the word for that, that is translated as greatly distressed in the, in the ESV is actually uh, the word that means to become alarmed. Uh, Jesus becomes alarmed about the things that are about to happen in his, his life. Uh, the word that is translated in the ESV as troubled literally means to become heavy. So, so Jesus is becoming alarmed and he is feeling this weight that is pressing down on him. Uh, that's what it means to, to be weighed down, to, to recognize that there is something significant, something heavy coming down uh, to him. And that weight is pressing on him. And it weighs on Jesus' soul. And he shares it with his disciples. He, he, he says to uh, the three that he took with him, My soul is very sorrowful even unto death. I've not felt that kind of grief before. Where I think that my burden is so heavy that I will die. Grieved to the point of, of death. The Bible is describing for us here how Jesus carries this immense emotional burden before he is crucified and he carries it all alone as the mediator. And so Jesus turns to prayer in that moment. In verse 35, it simply gives us a description of, of what Jesus asked. He, it's, it doesn't use Jesus' own words. It just says that he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. In verse 36, it goes a little bit further than that. It, it describes not only Jesus' posture in prayer, but the things uh, that he prays. Actually, the posture in prayer is in verse 35. Jesus goes beyond where the disciples are, and he falls on the ground. And he, and he prays to his Father. And he says, all things are possible for you Remove this cup from me. Well, that informs what is making Jesus greatly alarmed. It informs what it means that Jesus is troubled. It is the hour that he is facing. It is the cup that he will be asked to drink. And what Jesus is facing in that hour is that as the sinless one, he is about to be counted as sin. Now, you and I can't really fathom what that is because we are sinful. And so whenever we're blamed for sin, we can understand at least some sense of culpability on our part. Even if we think we're innocent to the thing that we're, uh, we're accused of, we, we know that we're not perfect people and, and we recognize that, that we have sinned in some way. But, but when Jesus is about to be counted as sin, 
he is to be counted as the thing that is most repugnant to him. Without sin, Jesus, the Son of God, sinless in his perfection. And so he becomes alarmed. He becomes troubled about what is about to happen to him. He's about to have this cup given to him. And he's asking for this cup to be removed. Now, what what is the cup? The cup is the wrath of the Father poured out on Christ for the sins of his people. It is a very common illustration. You see it in the book of Revelation. You see it also in the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 51 and verse 17, where it's talking about Israel's Uh, the judgment of God on Israel. And there the prophet says, wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of His wrath. That's what Jesus is facing. He's facing the reality that He will drink the cup of God's wrath for the sins of His people. He will become sin as the sinless one. And Jesus asks for the hour to pass him by and for the cup to be removed from him. Now again, that that word remove, you're always limited when you're translating. And and sometimes there is is um, an emotion or a sense that sits behind a word that, that is hard to bring into an English word as you're translating it. But the Greek word is is not just to to take away responsibility. Jesus is not just asking, please let me not have to do this. But when it says remove, that word remove has associated with this this sense of, of picking up and transporting it away from. So Jesus isn't just saying, please let me not have to do this. Jesus is saying to the Father, this burden, remember it says at the beginning that Jesus was very heavy. This burden that is pressing down on him, he is asking the Father to lift it up uh, from his back. As Jesus faces the grim reality of becoming sin for his people, as he anticipates the Father's wrath being poured out on him, it causes him real, soul-rending sorrow. It's hard for us It's impossible for us to imagine. But try, if you can. Imagine the greatest sorrow you can imagine. Imagine the cruelest betrayal that you can imagine and then add to it the reality of the fullness of the wrath of God about to be poured out on you for the sins of another if you in any way are able to imagine that. And that is what Christ is facing. The worst kind of betrayal plus the wrath of God on him, a sinless man. That is what Christ endures and even more than we can imagine. But what we see here in this text is that the alarm that Christ feels And the weight with which he is being crushed in his soul does not control him. Yes, he does ask for the hour to pass him by. And he does ask for the cup to be removed from him. But he doesn't doesn't want that more than the will of the Father being fulfilled in his life. And so we didn't read to the end of what Jesus asked in his prayer and in verse 36, all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, Jesus says, but what is, how does he finish the prayer? Yet not what I will, but what you will. Uh, the sorrow of Jesus is intense. He bears it alone as the mediator, and yet he bears it willingly doing the bidding of the Father, the will of of the Father. Now, in contrast to Jesus' sorrow, we look at the fatigue of the disciples. It's not the other eight, the second tier of the disciples. Maybe these are the 
the, the three that he takes along with him, his inner circle, uh, Peter and James and John. And Jesus has brought them along. The other disciples are just left there to wait. Sit here while I pray, he says in verse 32. But in, but in 34, he calls Peter and James and John, and he tells them, remain here and watch. He's asking them to be alert with him. Jesus' three chosen disciples, they've been given the privilege of, of comforting Christ, preparing him for his crucifixion, watching with him. Be on your guard, Jesus asks, of these three men. Now, these are all the same disciples who, in verse 31, emphatically said to Jesus, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Every single one of the disciples said the same thing as, as Peter. And here they are, falling asleep. In verse 37, Jesus comes back after praying and, and he finds them asleep. And he says to these tired men, could you not watch for one hour? I'm sure that stung a little bit when, the Jesus, when Jesus said that to the disciples. Because he's making an observation of Peter and, and James and John. And what is he saying about them? At worst, he's saying that they're not very helpful. Certainly making an observation about how weak they are. These three men who, who thought they were so strong and, and they come to watch with Jesus in the garden, but he prayed so long. Can you not watch for one hour? That's what Jesus asks. Can you imagine a prayer that lasts one hour? Next Sunday morning, if I get up and our congregational prayer is one hour, where would your mind be? Fifteen minutes in? Where would you go in your, in your mind? Would you, after you got into the car when the service of o was over, would you grumble a little bit about the length of the prayer? Would you fall asleep? That happens even to very well-intentioned Christian people. Acts 20 and verse 9 talks about Eutychus. You remember the story? Paul is in Ephesus. He's preaching. The evening service, I guess, and he's preaching well into the night, it says. He preaches for hours, and then he gets his second win, and he preaches some more. And Eutychus is sitting in the windowsill. He desires to hear the word of God. And what happens? He falls to his death. He falls out the window. So that can happen even to a well-intentioned Christian because man is weak. And that weakness is recorded here in this text three times. Jesus returns three times to the disciples and every time the disciples are asleep again. The first time, Jesus singles out Peter. He, he urges him to be watchful. He urges him to pray so that he would not enter into temptation. That's in verse 37. In verse 39, he goes away. He prays his theme, the same words. Comes back in verse 40. And he finds them sleeping again. And, and he gives a picture of these men so that we wouldn't be too hard on Peter and James and John. It says he, he finds them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy. Now, I know both from being on this side of the pulpit and from being on that side of the pulpit what it can be like to have eyes that are very heavy while you're listening to God's Word. You know the feeling. It's a terrible feeling. You're fighting for your eyes to stay open. You want your eyes to stay open. But uh, you've, you've been busy and it's been a hard week and, you're, and you do get sleepy. That's what's happening to the disciples. We can relate to them in, in some way. It says uh, that Jesus had gone away and prayed the same words. His first prayer was for one hour. Is this prayer for an hour as well? Maybe. Maybe. It's a, a time of prayer where Jesus goes away and, and leaves them alone. And you see the difference between Jesus and the disciples. See, at the beginning of our text, it said that Jesus became alarmed and was very heavy. Jesus was heavy in his soul. The disciples are heavy in their eyes. They're not sharing what Jesus is going through. 
And when Jesus confronts them with their sin the second time, they're a, a little bit sheepish. They're embarrassed over their weakness. It says they did not know what to answer him. They are overcome by their weakness. And, and what a contrast that is, again, to verse 31. These men who said, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Well, here they are falling asleep repeatedly as Jesus asked them to watch and pray. Well, we can be like that too, can't we? Overconfident in our ability. Overconfident in our spirituality overconfident in what we offer to God as members of His church. The gospel needs man's help. God's plan needs man's help. Don't we so easily forget just how weak we are? Yes, God uses means. He uses people to proclaim His gospel. He uses people to carry out His plan. But it is His gospel And it is His plan. Man is not contributing what God is missing. Man is not contributing what God lacks. In man's weakness, he is not helpful to Christ. Christ faces the wrath of God alone. And when He comes back the, the third time and He finds them sleeping, He simply says, it is enough. The hour has come. And then we see something of the betrayal of Jesus in verse 41 and following. So the hour has come. The hour of Christ's betrayal has arrived. The Son of Man, Jesus says, is betrayed into the hands of sinners in in verse 41. Now that is an astounding statement. Uh, Understood in light of Daniel's prophecy. The Son of Man being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Son of Man is a term that Jesus adopted about Himself, which is of Old Testament origin, from Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. I want to read Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14 to you to see what the Son of Man inherits from God. It says in verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man, and He came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And this Son of Man is being given over to sinful man. What does the Son of Man receive from the Ancient of Days? Well, it says that He receives dominion, glory, and a kingdom. Why does the Son of Man receive those things from the Ancient of Days? It says in Daniel 7 that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve Him. And for how long is the Son of Man given this inheritance from the Ancient of Days? It says... In Daniel 7, that his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And that Son of Man is about to be handed over to sinful men? That is a stunning reality. Even though he's the heir of all things, even though he's deserving of worship and thanks, he's about to be handed over to sinners. You see that kind of betrayal pictured at times in different accounts of Scripture. For example, take the account of of David and Absalom. Absalom is the usurper. David leaves Jerusalem fleeing for his life because his own son has taken his throne. And his own son pitches a tent on the roof of the palace to prove just how deep his despising of his father runs. The enemy within for David is his own son. And as grievous as that is, in Jesus' case, the betrayal is even worse. Because at some level, David and Absalom are of the same kind. 
I'm not justifying what Absalom did by any stretch of the imagination, but they are both men fighting against each other. Jesus is the creator of heaven and earth. And he comes and he's betrayed by his creation. His creation despises the king of glory and will not bend its knee to him. And yet this is exactly why Jesus Christ came to Jerusalem in the first place. It's not that these things happen to Jesus as if he's passive in in all of these things. When sinful people come to betray Christ, it's part of the eternal, divine plan of redemption. And Christ's death is part of that plan. In eternity past, this betrayal was known and willed. Now, that doesn't excuse the weakness of man, the betrayal of sinful men. It doesn't excuse Judas and his selling Christ for 30 pieces of silver. But it does show the great willingness of Christ to suffer these things according to the Father's will as mediator for man without man's help, on his own. And so as we think about Christ and his lonely waiting in the garden, as we think about his sorrow, his turning to the Father, his, his isolation from the disciples even who, who are unable to, to watch with him, and, and as we think about his betrayal, there's really three things that I want us to consider as we learn from this text. The first is that we should marvel at the willingness of Christ to suffer for the salvation of his people. Christ comes to save a weak people. In this text, the the disciples are, are portrayed as woefully inept. They are they are physically weak, they are physically sleepy, and you might say that they are spiritually so as well. And we see it very clearly about the disciples. If we don't watch ourselves, if we're we're not careful, we might even shake our heads in dismay at the behavior of the disciples. But the things that we see very clearly in the lives of the disciples, we don't recognize as easily in ourselves. And that is often the case when it comes to people. We see the failings of others quite easily, but when it comes to ourselves, we, we are a little bit dull about our own failings. And, and I include myself in that. I include all of you uh, in that as well. The reality is, as we sit here together and learn about the weakness of the disciples, we can't, we can't pivot from the disciples and then think that we are the better part of the church which motivated Christ to come. You are not the better part of the church. I am not the better part of the church. Christ Come for, came for nothing that he saw in us. But he came motivated by his own love for his people. And what is amazing is that he loves those so deeply who are so miserable to him. Man abandons, but Christ rejoices in his people. There is a heaviness in his soul in realizing the wrath of uh, the Father about to be poured out on him, but there is a willingness, a joy even, in suffering for his sinful people. Jesus knew the cross, and still he came. Hebrews 12 and verse 2, Christ, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and he is now seated in victory at the Father's right hand. And he achieved that willingly through suffering. So marvel at that. Marvel at that truth. Christ's willingness to suffer for the salvation of his people. The second thing that we can take away from this text is kind of a a corrective from the disciples. We learn from the disciples' mistake. Jesus charges his disciples to watch and pray. Now, the command to watch and pray isn't just for the disciples. <clears throat> the weakness of man is such that whenever man seeks to maintain the status quo and begins coasting in his Christian life, he never is ascending to greater glories. 
He's never being more sanctified when a, when a person begins to coast. He always begins to decline. And so Jesus says to his disciples and says to us, watch and pray. Isn't it interesting how Jesus uses prayer as interchangeable with this notion of watching? Regular, earnest, heartfelt, heartfelt, faith-filled discipline in prayer shows an understanding of your dependence on God. And that is Christian watchfulness. A recognition that the power of the Holy Spirit must be at work in you. That you cannot do it on your own. Uh, Of course, prayer can be abused. Just because you go through the motions of prayer in a day doesn't mean you're doing the, the thing that Jesus is describing here. doesn't mean that you're being watchful simply because you utter some words that begin with Father and end with Amen. That's not necessarily... Prayer. I'm not talking about prayer that we enter into simply because we're supposed to do that kind of thing. I'm talking about the kind of prayer that Jesus prayed. Seeking the Father in your time of need. Pouring out your sorrow on Him. Confessing your sin to Him. Acknowledging your failures without holding anything back to Him. Pleading with Him that He would grow you into maturity. These kinds of prayers show that you are being watchful. It's not smug. It's not self-confident. But it realizes your weakness and appeals to God for strength. So watch and pray, even as Jesus charged Peter and James and John to watch and pray. Pray. And then uh, lastly, uh, this text certainly instructs us in terms of how we ask God in prayer. God answers prayer according to his will and we should rest in that and rejoice in that this text really ruins what would be called the health and wealth gospel of our day right you 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 know people are charged with not having enough faith and that's why they don't have what they're asking for in prayer well that this text shipwrecks that unless you want to say that jesus didn't have enough faith if you want to say that Jesus didn't have enough faith, then you can, you can still maintain that, that thing that, 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 that God is obligated to answer prayer if you ask with enough faith. But Jesus uh, makes a shipwreck of that false doctrine. Jesus, with perfect, sinless sincerity, asks to forego the suffering of the cross. Now, some people seek to minimize that truth because of Hebrews 12 too. They talk about the joy that was before Christ, how he despised the shame, how he willingly went to the cross. And they, and they say he, he, can't, he can't have wanted to avoid the cross. And he is simply, he is simply praying that God would uh, alleviate his suffering in the, in the terms of the wrath. Well, uh, it's six and one and a half dozen the other, isn't it? Now, to avoid the wrath of God poured out is to avoid the cross. So Jesus is asking to avoid the cross. He goes willingly, but he asks, to avoid the cross. And even as he asks to avoid the cross, at the same time, he entrusts himself to the Father's will. Now, if that is the posture of prayer for Jesus, how much more should that be the posture of prayer for us? We are not able with any amount of certainty to predict anything about the future. Can you tell what will happen 30 minutes from now? Three minutes from now? You can't. And yet, Jesus knew the betrayal of Judas, that it was coming. He he predicted that it would come. And Jesus knew that Peter would deny him before the evening was through. He predicted that that would happen. And Jesus knew that after he was raised from the dead, his disciples would meet him in Galilee. He predicted that would happen and invited them to come. And yet he says, not what I will, but what you will. Is that your posture in prayer, Christian? Or is prayer something you use to manipulate God? Maybe we can get enough people praying for something and God will have to listen. Jesus is not compelled by the prayer, or God is not compelled by the prayer of His own Son. 
Maybe if we pray for something really good, then God will have to listen. Well, God is not compelled when Paul asks for the thorn in the flesh to be removed from him. God answers prayer according to his own will. Now, should man take offense when God does not answer prayer the way that we envision that he should? What is our relationship to the will of God? Is it fine with us so long as his will lines up with our will? What if the Lord would take your wealth? You've been a faithful Christian all your life. He's given you a measure of comfort your whole life and then he removes it from you. One afternoon, all your wealth gone. What if according to God's will, he takes all your children at the same time? That's what happened to Job. And what was his response? The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, that's Jesus' attitude in prayer. He's willing to have everything taken away, submit himself to the Father's will. And if he submits to the Father in prayer, even though he is the same in substance and equal in power and glory, how much more should we, his creation, be willing to do so? When we grumble against God and we say that we're angry with God because He didn't answer our prayer, we do not have the information that is necessary to justify that kind of response. We don't have the selflessness to justify that that kind of response. We don't have the sinlessness that, that would on any level justify grumbling against God's will as it is worked out, despite what we have prayed for. God is sovereign. Do you believe that? God is good. Do you believe that? God knows all things. Do you believe that? God works all things for the good of His people. Do you believe that? This is why in prayer we should with joy and peace in our heart be able to say to God, not what I will, but what you will. The Christian entrusts himself to the will of God in prayer, even as Jesus does here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here in Gethsemane, by his prayer, Jesus shows just how alone he is when he goes to the cross, that his suffering begins before the cross, even in his isolation in Gethsemane. It's not an isolation that is foisted on him by others. The Son of Man, who is the heir of power and dominion and an everlasting kingdom, receives these things in his suffering. His own people do not receive him. His prayer is not favorably answered, but he endures the cross. He does it willingly, entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Such is the suffering of our Lord, and it shows us his great affection for his people. Amen. Let us pray.